Hi, everybody. I'm David Gray. I am the executive director of the Pennsylvania Ballet. Thank you for coming to the first of what I'm hoping is going to be an ongoing tradition of uh, pre-performance talks. Uh, today, I am very excited to have with me uh, Jean-Pierre Froelich, known as JP, uh, who knows more about what you're going to see tonight than probably any living person. Uh, Jean-Pierre was uh, born and raised in New York City, and Jean-Pierre joined the New York City Ballet in 1972 at a time when George Balanchine and Jerome Robbins were very busy and working very hard. And over the years, JP worked very closely with Mr. Robbins. And when JP retired from dancing in 1990, he basically became Mr. Robbins' right and probably left hand. Uh, working with him on ballets and remembering ballets and now runs the, uh, the trust that administers and oversees the ballets and JP's life is spent running around the world setting these ballets. And it's uh, a, a real thrill for me to have him here because um, while I could tell you some things about these ballets, I've never danced them and I don't have any clue how I would put one on stage, but this is what JP does for a living and he's really good at it. And also, he happens to be just a really nice guy, which is also really wonderful. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce Jean-Pierre Froelich. And so, Jean-Pierre, we have three ballets we're doing tonight. In G major, what do you want? You were probably there when it was choreographed. Yes, I was there, but I never danced in the ballet, but I was uh, a member of the company at the time when Jerry actually choreographed it. But in G major is, there's another name to this ballet also. It's called En Sol, meaning the sun. And this is uh, composed, uh, the music is composed by a French uh, composer, Maurice Ravel. So um, it's, what you're going to see is a side of Jerry that's very partly Broadway, pro partly ballet. Um, it's If you watch the ballet, it's like you're seeing people on the beach. I always say to the dancers, think of yourselves being in Baywatch, the, the TV show or something, because it's like lifeguards and, and it's not really literally like that, but there's a sense of sun. You'll see the sun in the backdrop, a sense of a flirtation with the girls and the girls flirting with the boys. Uh, but it's something um, that Jerry, um, it's very interesting when Jerry choreographs, he listens to music and because he's from the theater and because that's where his true um, uh, way of working, for him there has to be a reason. The music has to speak to him and there has to be a reason why he choreographs something to that music. So it's a little bit, it's neoclassical, but no story, but at the same time you have a sense of being somewhere. But it's to um, a lead couple, which is one of the most beautiful parlors in the beginning, I mean in the middle, which was danced also by Kira uh, Kira Nichols, who's David's wife, so uh, who danced but, at City Ballet for a very long time. But it was also time. danced by Isabel Garin, and oh, that's my the wife. Paris Opera Ballet was his <laughs> wife. So, and in fact, we were talking to Francis Fayette, who is married to the dancer who's dancing it tonight, and I said to him, your wife can only be the second most beautiful woman I will ever see dance this role. And then we got into an argument last night, because now we've got three wives, and <laughs> anyway, I'm sure they're all in the top five. I, I guarantee you that. <laughs> yeah, but David said, no, 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 there's one at the top, and of course it's Kira. It's, okay. But um, it, it, it has a sense of, it's nothing that you need to really analyze, it's just you enjoy the dancers dance. The second ballet is very, very famous, which is Fancy Free, which became a Broadway show, which is running on Broadway right now on the town. Uh, I dance this ballet. I love this ballet. It's three sailors on shore leave in New York for the first time, and they heard all about these women in New York, and they're trying to meet these women, and they realize they're on 42nd Street in a, on a block that there's, haven't seen any women, so they decide to go in the bar, and then they decide to leave the bar, and then all of a sudden the first girl that they've seen, and first New Yorker, which is a very spunky New Yorker with a bit of a, an attitude, and they didn't expect it because they're easygoing guys. You know, they, you know, they're from three different places in America, and they all meet, and you'll see, with these sailors, you'll see their personalities when they dance. You know, there's a tough, tough guy. The short guy's tough, like a bulldog. The second guy's easygoing. Maybe, you know, was born in Kansas and lived on a farm. And the third one is more like, you know, from Chicago. 
you know, the one that really kind of runs the group, that that knows it all, the kind of the leader. And which role did you dance? I danced uh, the bulldog, the first sailor who does the <laughs> show-off sailor. But um, it's for me, Fancy Free is, is part of American history, a Broadway history. Uh, it was it changed the way Broadway was perceived and how people choreographed on Broadway. And and Jerry, and I call him call him Jerry because I called him Jerry all my life, even when I was this ten years old when I saw him and. Uh, but uh, he would tell a story with movement. If you watch this, it's this piece. I call it the piece because to me it's not a ballet; it's a play. Because he's telling a story, and in the movement that the dancers do, those are their lines. In in regards to being in a play, so I always tell them, you know, you need to be human, act uh, naturally, and even though it, there's some sections there stylized in a certain way but what's interesting about this piece is it was done in 1945 choreographed and nowadays uh certain people feel not people but the society has changed so uh with the first girl that's the spunky new yorker you know they play a game with her they tease her they grab a bag you know and she wants to go home or go to see her dad or pick up the, she's coming back from work and she has to get her laundry from the dry cleaners or something and she's got to get take the Staten Island Ferry. I give them all these stories to kind of think of the personality of who they should be, uh, the dancers that is. And um, they, uh, times have changed. So a lot of people have said to me, JP, you know, a woman won't be treated like that anymore. And I said, well, people have to think of it as a period piece. But at the same time, I have to, as I'm directing this or and coaching it, I'm telling the dancers, you have to be careful it's not a gang rape. You'll see what I mean when you see it, with the girl with the, with the red purse. It's, it's more, more, more like being in a playground, teasing a girl and taking her school bag, you know, and throwing it to the other guys. So it's very, very fine line nowadays. Because there has been some reviews that have said, critics have said, you know, no one get, you know, tossed around and picked up and treated like that. But they forget it's a period piece, and at that time, theater was different. Um, and then um, the last piece, which is um, the concert, which all of you are going to see yourselves on that stage. I'm, I'm telling you because it's about. Uh, people that come to a concert and you know how you watch ballet or you go to a concert you're, you start to daydream and you start to think about what you're going to buy at the store or you're not really focusing on what's really happening and the Chopin music makes them uh, have and create the most mundane fantasies they have and the music makes them become different people and you'll see um uh, a husband and wife, you know, they're, she's really mad at him because they're late at the concert and he's sweating carrying the chairs all the way down the parking lot, you know, like this, because she, uh, he wasn't supposed to go. This is my story to tell the dancers. She wanted somebody else to go, had to take her husband because she had a free ticket. Her girlfriend decided to say no. And he likes to be at home watching the game. He smokes a cigar. You know, and she has these two personalities. Part of her is very, she, to the people that she meets at the, let's say the, you know, friends of the opera, the friends of the ballet, people that meet and they meet the artists, they go to these functions. Uh, she puts a persona of a different person on, a different personality, but when she's home, she's always yelling at her husband. So she tries to cover up her second personality because it comes out and she's making noise while the concert's going on. So, um, because she's upset with her husband. Uh, you'll see a ballerina, a very beautiful girl that comes on, a woman that, that is a little aloof, a little cuckoo, and the husband starts to really like her, the wife gets jealous. There's a whole little uh, a shy boy who comes on that's an introvert, and you have a lady that's really annoyed because she's late and you know she's 
the usher that won't let her come in. She closed the door. She pushed the doors open. She sat down because she paid for this ticket. She doesn't care what anybody thinks. She's going to do what she wants. So it, you'll see all these little people that when you come to the ballet or to a recital or anything, you'll see these things happening. There are two matinee ladies that come in and meet each other every weekend and go to the ballet or the, the concert together. And they're always gossiping about what they did during the week. And then, you know, there's always somebody that opens a candy and makes noise. <laughs> and someone says, shh, you'll see all that. Um, it's a brilliant, brilliant piece. It's, a, it's theater. It's, uh, it's Jerry Robbins written I wanna, all I over it. I want to ask you something very specific because in watching rehearsal, um, one of the things that's really challenging this ballet is funny. It's intentionally funny. But the dancers aren't supposed to what, act funny. Right, right. The, the <laughs> and thing, it's an interesting... Yeah, the thing is, um, this ballet is really hard to actually put together because ballet dancers like to be broad. And the thing is, it's not that you make it funny, it's the situations that make it funny. You'll watch, if you watch old television shows, you know, Red Skelton or Jackie Gleason or all these old shows. And I used to watch them when I was a kid. So uh, it was the timing that made it funny. And it was the situations that made it funny. I was just looking at an old videotape of Jerry Robbins himself rehearsing these dancers. And he told the dancers the difference between this ballet, this and comedy and cheap taste is... A man bent, sitting down, ripping his pants, or a man pulling down his pants. The difference is you can just sit down and you rip your pants. It's an accident. You don't make it happen, and it's an accident. Pulling down your pants and showing your privates or your underpants, it's not an accident. So there's a difference between um, uh, cheap comedy and letting the situations happen for what they are. The problem is the dancers over time start to hear the laughs. So th the next performance starts to get broader. <laughs> the next performance becomes even more broad. So you have to go back, be a policeman, and tell him, calm down. Just do it the way you used to do it. Jerry Robbins used to do it himself. Many years ago at City Ballet, there was a couple who did the husband and, and ballerina. And he would go back and say, OK, now, easy. That's enough. You got to tone it down now. So there's a, a tendency. Because you got the laugh, you want to get the same laugh the next night. So you have to be really very, very careful. I will keep that in mind. If you're not here Saturday, I'll go crack whip. So um, you'll get to talk to me anytime, but you don't get to talk to JP very often. Uh, any any questions, comments, concerns? Well, maybe not the concerns, but questions. Sir. I think it's because I, uh, w because I like these ballets. It's because, for me, um, it's not about, OK, when you watch ballet, sometimes abstract ballet, say Balanchine or Billy Forsythe or some modern choreographer, um, they're, they're doing steps. And a lot of people don't really understand what's really going on. Uh, I believe, and Jerry did, and even Balanchine did, because you know he, there's a false um, statement that, that there's a statement he said. He said something to somebody, and people take it for, for verbatim. He said, just dance. Don't think, just dance. And why, why he said that to somebody was because they would get very nervous on stage. So he would tell them, please, you're thinking too much. Don't analyze it. Just, just do it. So people think that's what he really meant. A uh, ballet like Agon, I don't know if anyone knows what I'm talking about, a ballet called Agon. It's to Stravinsky. And if you look at it, you, you think it's very abstract. Yes, it is. But when I did the ballet, he coached me in it, in it and he said, you're a court jester. There are certain movements. The reason why you do the movements is because you're a court jester. For me, to answer your question, uh, Jerry Robbins was a great theater mind. He had a great theater mind. And I worked very closely with him. So... When I, when you start writing notes for him, let's say we're running a rehearsal, he's running a rehearsal, and you're next to him, and, he, and he's giving corrections, and I'm writing the corrections down, you start to think like him. You start to understand who he is as a, as a, an artist or as a human being. But 
uh, I think it's really important that the dancers understand why they're doing something. Because a lot of dancers have said to me, you're the only one that actually tries to explain why. Because a lot of people don't explain that. They just give you the steps. But some dancers are smart, and they can figure it out. Some dancers you have to tell. It's like actors. Some actors you got to take them to this place, to that place, and they still don't get it right. Some actors have instincts, and dancers have instincts. Sometimes you don't have to tell them anything, and, it, and they're doing it naturally. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, there's another question here. A few years later, uh, I think Jerome Robbins did the choreography for West Side Story, if I'm correct. Can you comment on the same idea of uh, uh, ballet versus uh, dance or well, when he did West Side Story, the most of his cast members were ballet dancers, actually. <laughs> um, I think he liked, um, well, West Side Story. You know, that didn't become a hit until the movie. It wasn't a hit when it was first done. It didn't get the greatest reviews. The movie is where it became really well known um, to that extent. But uh, I think Jerry was very much... Um, looking at what's going on in the world, looking at people out in the street. He would see what was happening. He loved young people. He loved youth. He always loved Kira, for example. Um, he picked her out of the court de ballet to do spring section of Four Seasons before it was Four Seasons. And Jerry found Kira Nichols before Balanchine really used her. And... and um, Jerry always had this uh, soft spot for his wife, Kira. But that's not what we're talking about. But he, he liked youth. He liked the idea. And he was very aware there was these gangs in New York on the Upper West Side. And he would go around the neighborhood and get to see what was going on and talk to them a lot. Uh, and then he wanted to instill that into dancers. Um, what he did to make the dancers, the Broadway dancers, understand he would separate the Sharks and the Jets. They could not talk to each other in rehearsals. He wanted them to get that feeling of not liking each other and not speaking to each other. But he was very ruthless. If he wanted to get, he, if he wanted something out of you for the character, he would actually do certain things that nowadays you're probably told to leave the theater. But he would, you know, put you against somebody else in the cast. You may have heard Jerry had a reputation for not always being warm and fuzzy, but um, I developed a soft spot for him when he when we had a child, and Jerry loved playing with our son, and so my wife would perform something, I would bring my son to the theater, and after the performance, my wife would be waiting for Jerry to come say, hopefully something like, good job, but he'd come by the dressing room and he'd say, is Joe here? What? And finally my wife would say, so what did you think of the performance? He'd say, you'll get your notes. <laughs> No, there was. I had a soft spot for him also. I mean, there was. There was. I danced for him. I knew him since so. Like I said, not ten. I, I lied. Thirteen, fourteen. But uh, because he was still doing his Broadway, and then when he came back to the company, when he did dances at a gathering, was when I first got to. In 1969 is when I started the relationship with Jerry, and then he did a piece called Watermill, and he took me out of SAB, out of the school to do this piece. Uh, I wasn't in the company yet. So I was, um, he was a big part of my life, I mean, for a long time. Other questions, thoughts, feelings? Yes, over here. So how does the piece change when you sit it on different casts and different companies? Do you, do you have to adjust the piece for the company or does the company have to meet the company? Did, did, did everyone hear that question? When he goes to set a ballet, does does the ballet change for the people that he's setting it on, or do the people or does the company change for the, to adapt to the ballet? Um, usually, the company adapts to the ballet, but the theaters are different. So, but you know, Jerry would tweak when he was alive. When I used to travel with him, he used to go to different companies and tweak things, change things for different companies sometimes because you know. He's reproducing his own work, so he can do whatever he wants. I'm, I'm looking after a legacy, so I don't feel I can do whatever I want. Uh, but there are many choices to take from. 
as I said to a coworker once, they said, I've never seen that before. Well, I said, I'm never, I'm not making it up. You look at some videos of other companies when he rehearsed them and put these ballets together, he made those changes. So um, you, you, you try to uh, do what's true to the ballet. Uh, and because Jerry worked his ballets and he reworked his pieces and he was such a great theater man that, you know what, I don't have his brilliance. Uh, I, don't, I didn't have his eye. I learned to have his eye by learning from him. Uh, but it's... Um, and, and what's good about Jerry, which I have a lot of dancers tell me about, I have a lot of dancers say to me, I learned so much from doing Robin's ballets because it's the essence of dancing to each with each other, not dancing for the audience. He creates a mood and a place on stage, and you guys are like looking through a keyhole, peeking in, and you're not, and to them, you're not here. You're just not here. You're the fourth wall in the exercise and acting. You're not, you're not here. You're going into their world. And that's something that Jerry created. And you know, Balanchine knew that. And Balanchine pushed Jerry to continue working and choreographing. And he was a brilliant man, Balanchine. So that I grew up with both of them. And to me, that was the 70s and 80s. Those were the wonder years. I mean, ballet is different now due to social media. Things have changed. People are, I mean, it's another conversation, but you know, self-promoting. You know, with all these things they have. So the mystery of the 70s, 80s, and 60s with Nureyev, Varishnikov, Balanchine, Robbins, all these stars, to me they were stars because you didn't really hear that much. It was always, you heard about them, but you never really got to see them very often. And when you saw them, that was a big deal. Can I just jump in? One other thing that, in response to your question, I think is kind of interesting. You helped cast these ballets and so one of the ways that I guess you try to sort of preserve the, the ballets is in the choices of who's dancing which roles. That's correct. Yeah, it, it depends on the casting. Uh, yeah, it depends on also the casting and, and the certain look of a dancer. In the concert, you'll understand why, because it's about their body language too and how they move is partly the character. It's not just the way you look physically. It is a way you look physically. You might have a dancer being the wife that's a little bit more rounder than another dancer, but it works. So, okay, well, I, I'm I think we're almost out of time because we have to let the ushers actually do their job in getting the other people into the theater shortly. But uh, any short, quick questions? Any? Well, folks, thank you for joining us for our first of these conversations, and I hope you will spread the word that we're doing these and get your friends to come to jump here. Thank you very much for, well, actually, for all you've done with this, this, this spring, and you'll continue to. By the way, he is also a choreographer, and next season, I believe you'll get to see one of his works on our stage, so we're very excited about that as well. Anyway, thank you all for being here. Thank you.